Hello everyone and thanks for joining us. Welcome to Open Infra Live, uh, the Open Infrastructure Foundation's weekly live show sharing productions, case studies, open source demos, industry conversations and the latest updates from the global open infrastructure community. This is episode 14 already and uh, we have seen some great content um, and we'll see some great content coming up. So I hope that you can join us every Thursday at 14 UTC, streaming on YouTube, Facebook, Air, Link and LinkedIn. Um, as I mentioned, this is a live show, so uh, we'll be saving some time at the end of the episode for Q&A. Uh, feel free to drop questions during the show into the comments section, and we will answer as many as we can. Today's episode is uh, part of a series on large-scale OpenStack infrastructure promoted by the OpenStack Large Scale SIG. We invite operators of large-scale deployments and get them to present how they solve a given operation challenge and discuss live between themselves their different approaches. Today's topic is spare capacity. One of the reasons workloads moved to virtualization and clouds was to avoid having underutilized resources. But as demand for resources goes up and down, the cloud itself can now have a lot of spare capacity. How do OpenStack-based large-scale clouds manage their spare capacity? Our guests today are Brandon Conlon, DevOps Manager at Verizon Media, Chris Bermudez, Engineering Manager at InMotion Hosting, Eric Johansson, Senior Systems Engineer at City Network, Victor Molnar, Cloud Architect for Open Telecom Cloud, and last but not least, Belmiro Morera, Cloud Architect at CERN, who will host this discussion. So uh, passing on to you, Belmiro, take it away. So thank you, Thierry. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Belmiro Moreira. I work at CERN. CERN is the European Organization for Nuclear Research. And today I, I will drive this discussion about how different cloud providers manage spare capacity. I'm really happy to be in this great panel that represents different kinds of clouds, public, private, and scientific clouds. To kick off the discussion, I will show you a very small presentation to give you some, some context. Here we go. So moving workloads to, to the cloud has several benefits for the users. We won't go through all of them, of course, but instead we will try to focus in the scalability and pay what you use model. One of the promises of cloud computing is that users can start small, and when they are ready, they can scale massively their workloads. This is the illusion of unlimited available resources. Also, they don't need to care about the underlying infrastructure. They don't need any more to manage the hardware, go through long and expensive hardware purchases, and at the end, uh, buy more capacity that they don't really need because, you know, ju just, just in case. So moving now to the slides, however, as Operators um, of large-scale infrastructures, um, we all know that to provide the illusion of unlimited resources to users, it's um, a huge, huge challenge. The infrastructure needs to be ready for the ups and downs uh, in the demand uh, from our users. So the problem of over-provision capacity that was in the past in the user side has been transferred to the cloud providers. This can lead to the cloud providers uh, having spare capacity, meaning that the resources are not efficiently used. So I'm sure that different clouds have different strategies to handle this spare capacity problem. Um, maybe quotas, spot instances, uh, reservation strategies, um, different hardware purchase models. Um, and this is what we will try to discover today. And how these different OpenStack clouds are sol solving this problem. So let's start the, the discussion. And uh, for everyone that is following us in the live stream, please don't forget to leave your questions in the comment section. 
we'll try to do our best to, to answer them. So hello, everyone. Um, I think the first question that needs to be answered is, who are you? Uh, I know some of you um, already. So let's start with Chris. Can you tell us a little bit uh, more about you and um, um, in motion hosting cloud? Yeah, yeah. So I'm Chris Bermudez. I'm the engineering manager for uh, InMotion Hosting, also one of the technical leads for our uh, Flex Metal Cloud product, which is a um, on-demand private cloud that we can deliver under uh, under an hour is what we we aim to do. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of the gist of it. I've been in the the field here for for a little bit and a uh, little bit new to the whole engineering world and and, and OpenStack as a whole. Great. Um, thank you. Eric, you want to go next? Yep. Uh, I'm Eric. Uh, I'm a Sedan Systems Engineer at Sedan uh, Network, European hybrid cloud provider. Um, my current focus is a little bit more on the automation and tooling side, not necessarily purely with OpenStack, uh, which also involved the, the gathering of metrics and alerting and, and the visualization of, of uh, in this case, capacity management. Great. Um, Brendan, want to go next? Hi, yeah, I'm uh, Brendan Conlon. I'm the DevOps manager for Verizon Media. Uh, we have our own private cloud system that's utilized you know, across the company. Uh, mainly supporting all the different web services and, and products that we have. So fairly large implementation. Uh, yeah, I think that's about it. Thank you. And we have Victor from T-Systems. Yes, thank you. So my name is Victor Wallerath. Currently, I'm working in as a cloud architect in the OpenTacom cloud, and uh, basically also, let's say, as a product owner of the hardware part, uh, I'm responsible for capacity management as well in our uh, environment. And mainly this open tech on cloud is for uh, as a public cloud. So basically for big, uh, big companies, but besides that we also offer hybrid solutions. So not just uh, a public cloud provider. And also regarding the scales, it's, I would say it's, it's quite big. So at least in Europe. So basically currently, for example, for us, we are talking about uh, 700,000 vCPU or something like that. So it's, uh, from my point of view, quite a big environment. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. And um, well, and also uh, we have me. Um, we did the, the CERN cloud. So the CERN private cloud uh, has around um, 6,000 compute nodes and manages as well 8,000 bare metal nodes uh, through Ironic. And we have around 30,000 virtual machines and in infrastructure. Um, the cloud supports the different organization activities, um, administration, different IT services. But essentially, um, more than 80% of the cloud uh, capacity is to process the scientific data from the different experiments um, in the organization. All right. Um, so let's address the problem in the room. Um, do you have spare capacity in your cloud? So who wants to start with, with this? I think uh, if not mind, I can start with this one because uh, especially for us, you know, as a public cloud provider, it's really important to have spare capacity because as you just stated in the beginning of your presentation, what we promise to the customers is basically we promise endless resources and uh, we also promise that they can consume anything anytime when they need it. So that's why for us, it's, it's a really crucial question and it's really important to have uh, anytime a spare capacity. But to be able to do that, because naturally it's also uh, a high value business, so we need to care about uh, how much we keep as a spare capacity and uh, also why we are keeping as a spare, how we can reduce our cost. Because from my point of view, it's also really important, not just about the wasting of resources, but also if you waste the resources and beside that also you waste the operation cost, then it will still be higher. So in this way, uh, from our point of view, what we every time consider 
is the most important part is to serve out any customer request when they need. So that's why for us, we defined, let's say, our value chain, how much time we need in case if there is a customer request uh, to be able to deliver it to our cloud. So basically, how much time we need for order hardware to uh, deliver it to the data center, rack it, cable it, install it, uh, and so on and so on. And based on that, when we figured out uh, as a baseline uh, this time, then based on the previous trends, what we are currently checking, we can figure out that based on the previous trends, for example, for the following time, I mean the same amount of time that we need for a big delivery, how much capacity should be necessary. But to be able to, let's say, make it even more harder, you know, if we are talking about OpenStack, then OpenStack has lots of different parts, not just flavors, but it was also mentioned um, before by the Miro, we need to consider uh, with the Ironic, the Bermuda servers, we also need to consider some dedicated hosts and lots of different parts. And also in OpenStack, uh, lots of uh, upper layer services what is rely on this IES solutions. So in this way, um, almost every time, uh, what we are checking and, and we call it fragmentation because you are not able to 100% allocate any of your physical device just in case if you use it as a one one ratio or a bare metal or dedicated host or something like that. So in this way, we, uh, we calculate the, let's say, loss because of the fragmentation and then we keep as much spare capacity as we can, what is able to let's say, what is necessary to be able to survive until we are able to do a big uh, expansion in case if it's needed. Because as a business, what is the most important part to serve at the customers because not sure they are generate money. Uh, so in this way, I think this is the most uh, uh, optimal one. So what you are saying is that basically is for public uh, cloud providers is inevitable to, to have spare capacity. Yes. Right. Yeah, but also you know it's different in in different cloud providers because you also need to uh, consider uh, if, for example, public uh, public cloud provider is also uh, creates the hardware from themselves. That's a different story. If you need to buy it, then it's also a different story. Yeah. So for yeah. us, you know, um, because we are in partnership with uh, with Huawei. So for us, these hardware deliveries are a little bit, uh, I would say, more easier. Uh, so also, we are able to do that in some cases, not just uh, keep spare capacity uh, inside, uh, let's say, our server rooms, but we can also keep some spare servers in the warehouse. Yeah. And what I also mentioned, that is from my point of view, also really important, even if you have the spare capacity, and this is where you are able to reduce your cost, and in this way, be more efficient, you need to consider when something is not used, then how you will be able to, uh, for example, turn it off. So in this way, because also, for example, for the BMS Ironic, it just starts when somebody would like to use it. So if you are able to do something also with the normal flavors, so for example, when you have a lots of spare capacity, but from the spare capacity, a big bunch is sitting over off, then in this way, you are also able to reduce your cost. Yeah. So let's try to touch all these points uh, later on. Um, I would like to give the opportunity to others also to give their opinion. Eric, you also have a public clouds. Yeah, I definitely agree with with, uh, with Victor on that case. I mean, we, we are a hybrid cloud provider, so we, we have both uh, seven public regions globally uh, uh, and also uh, a number of High security clouds, uh, which are either private or multi-tenant as well, uh, but public clouds is a very, very different story compared to most of the the, the private regions we have. Uh, and as such, we we have more spare capacity in the public regions because, uh, just like Victor said, we need it. Uh, I would like to. Uh, I usually say it's a little bit more wild west uh, on that side. Um, and we try to solve that in 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 uh, some cases, uh, like like Victor mentioned, having spare hardware in the different data centers. Uh, we also have some 
uh, some examples where we run where we run some of that hardware in pre-production environments, uh, which makes it easier to to either ship or move if it's in the same DC into the production environment when we see the need. Uh, and we have some other use cases as well where where, where we can. Uh, reschedule uh, certain aspects. For example, I mean, we, we run a lot of test and sandbox systems internally, uh, which we can reschedule to different regions based on, on uh, the metrics we're pulling in on the spare capacity at the moment. Uh, we have an education branch that that runs uh, many many things, but uh, one of their their uh, things they're running are self-paced courses, uh, which means that they can one of those runs they can shift a little bit uh, to different public clouds or different public regions depending on how the the capacity looks at the moment right chris do you do you have something to add in the oh, public yeah, cloud space? So, um, yeah for us it's a little bit different since we are we are a hosting provider uh, and everything we do have multiple product lines. So our, our main goal right now is, is just building a unified hardware platform across our products and everything to pretty much just kind of place hardware wherever the need is. So so yes, we, we do have spare capacity, but, but we don't think of it in the same way as just cloud capacity. Um, so whether it be like like Ramnode, one of our sister companies, whether they're scaling out their public or their public cloud, or whether it be for Flex Metal within our, our private cloud or storage clusters that we provide, we kind of just see what's the demand for each of those and, and allocate hardware accordingly. All right. And uh, Brandon, the private, the big private cloud side. Yeah, I think it's I think it's similar to be honest. Uh, you know, maybe not to quite the scale. Uh, you know, it's really the same. We as a team make the same promises to our customers who just happen to be in the same company. You know, so even though you call it public, they know, private, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, they know, and they, and they know exactly how long. It takes you to get hardware in place and get things set up as well. So, you know, it, it definitely makes it interesting. It's a, it's definitely a problem that needs a lot of effort to to look into. And there's always the confliction, you know, utilization versus you know having enough sp spare capacity available at any time for anybody to use. You know, so it's definitely something that we have to balance. We have. I think almost 40 different clusters, so probably about 40 different control planes uh, running different instances on different networks for varying different purposes. So the fragmentation sometimes is is very difficult to manage. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you've mentioned moving hosts about. It still takes time. You know, it's still effort. It's not it's not free to move things even within a data center. So. It can be it can be very tricky to keep on top of that capacity and balance the, the utilization and never letting your you know user base have any issues due to capacity is the I think the key. So, so I, I also can can give uh, this this certain uh, example. If you ask me directly if we have spare capacity, I I think I could immediately say no. But then, of course, you question why. Um, <laughs> so as I told you, more than 80% of our capacity is due to um, processing data from the different experiments. Um, and we strive, actually, always for more capacity um, to run all this processing uh, power. Um, so only less than 20% of the cloud is dedicated for services. So really for the users for the organization to interact with the, the APIs and the create their services, also the, for the IT department to create the IT services um, for the organization. And, and of course there, um, we need to have the capacity for the users to create this in a dynamic way. But then we try to, to use um, some some techniques to reduce this, this spare capacity um, maximum as possible. Um, and I think we're going to talk about this later, uh, what we do to overcome um, spare capacity. All right. So 
How can we assess then a good balance between spare capacity and uh, demand fluctuation? I think when everyone starts their clouds, they don't know, or it's different for private clouds, but especially in the public cloud world, they will not know the demand. And then there is a big shopping season, for example, and everyone starts building websites and it requires capacity. So how you guys manage uh, this demand with the, the spare capacity that you have? Victor, if you want to go. Yeah. I can, sure. So basically, you know, I think uh, regarding this question, the most important part that we need to consider is the size of the cloud. Yes, you mentioned we are talking about uh, mainly uh, public ones regarding this one, but also if your cloud become bigger, bigger and bigger, then in this way, these issues become smaller, smaller and smaller. Because in case, for example, if you have 1 million core, then it doesn't matter even if in the Christmas period, uh, somebody just, or some projects start to consume 10,000 more or 50,000 more, because you don't need to care about that. Uh, well, I think if they are if they are being used, these one million cars, that will be an issue, right? Yeah, yeah, because but, your uh, client, clients will be bigger as well. Yes, you're you're totally right. But uh, if uh, uh, we start at the point that we just discussed, that if we keep spare capacity as a public cloud provider, then based on, for example, what I mentioned, uh, we aim uh, is to have the spare capacity. Uh, I mean, the amount of the spare capacity, but even if we receive such kind of a big, uh, big demand for any customer, then we will be able to serve out and, un and under they consume all of the spare capacity, then we will still have enough time to be able uh, to build up more. So basically this is our, uh, our target and this way, naturally we need to focus a lot on the, uh, for example, on the automation. So basically we are moving to the direction that we would like to achieve to be able to uh, provide new resources or put new resources to the cloud uh, faster, faster, and faster. Because in this way, if we are able to uh, put uh, put there more resources faster, then uh, it will be easier also to handle, and we don't need to have that much of spare capacity. So then it will becomes more efficient. And the mm -hmm. other part, what is a little bit more technical, you know, if we are talking about spare capacity, and it was also, uh, if I'm not mistaken, by uh, Brendan and Eric also mentioned this fragmentation, and not just me. Uh, regarding this one, what you can do if you're, let's say, make the Nova scheduling more optimal. Because if the scheduling, more optimal, and if you have the possibilities for live migration, then in this way you are able to reduce the fragmentation. So then you also need to have less spare capacity and less wasted resources. So this is uh, especially how, how we see or how I see this uh, question. But because uh, the same things was also mentioned by Eric and Brendan, I'm also really curious about their opinion regarding this one. I think you, you touched uh, an important point when you said that uh, adding hardware in a dynamic way and very fast to the cloud can uh, can help that, and is a, one solution to mitigate this. However, I see it that in the times that we are now, with uh, so many shortage of um, um, hardware components, this is even a bigger challenge, right? Um, because I see that purchase orders could be delayed because of shortage of a component. Yeah, GPUs and you're totally right. So and what you just mentioned is GPU. So yeah, regarding, for example, this uh, high performing GPUs by the NVIDIA, in most of the cases, even if you are the cloud provider, in some cases, you need to wait months for that. So that's why uh, uh, for these topics, the capacity management is, is more crucial than in the, in the other ones, because it's harder and take longer to be able to serve out in case if there is a big need. And also because this GPU ones naturally much more expensive than, than a normal compute server. So that's why you also don't want yeah. to uh, have, uh, I don't know, hundreds or thousands of server unused because uh, yeah, then basically it will not worth to have it. So we have a question for, uh, from Prakash um, where he asks, how do you measure your capacity? Um, Eric? Can you address that? I, um, in pure measurement, well, I mean, technically we're using the Prometheus stack with a bunch of exporters, but uh, for us, I think the whole 
spare capacity and how to assess if we have a good balance is down to two uh, things. The technical side, where we try to build historical trends uh, and, and from experience determine if uh, if we should scale, if we should scale up, down, uh, and so on. Uh, but also customer communication. Uh, I think Victor mentioned before with customer requests. And, and if we see uh, one of our larger customers, for example, or a new one, uh, and, and we predict uh, a burst increase of resources in one of our regions, uh, we do have, a, I mean, we, we do try to have good, good communication with those customers and, and making sure that they will, will let us know beforehand because the, the historical trends will only give you so much uh, and, and the burst increase and, and decrease as well is, is probably where, where we struggle the most uh, in, in the sense that, like, like you mentioned, that um, in, short, in short time scale very much. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, to, to, to measure, like I said, we use we use the Prometheus stack. It's just a, a mm -hmm. one of many technical tools uh, for how to do it, uh, primarily with the OpenStack exporter uh, and right. some others. Right. Victor, there yeah, is something uh, Basically, that just one question. Uh, it's, it's maybe for, for Eric, regarding these measures, because you know uh, there are lots of different ways what you can measure and in most of the cases uh, and most of the companies like also for example as at the beginning start to measure uh, how much free uh, cpu cores we have how much memory how much gpu uh, how much uh, this space and so on and so on but then to be able to avoid this thing that we just discussed this fragmentation we also start to measure for and create such kind of a data at a periodic time how much we can uh, start for every single type of different flavors. So in this way, let's say we are also able to see our capacity, our free capacity, uh, based on how much uh, new uh, ECSs and services we can create. Mm -hmm. So then we don't need to consider, for example, what we previously discussed on hardware level, this fragmentation. Yeah. You also do it uh, in in your environment like this one, or just measure the the hardware part. No, I mean we 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 measure similar, like you mentioned. We try to measure for for not only for the region itself, but also for individual computes of how how much resources we have left on that compute, for example, or a network node uh, running in free agents or or whatever it could be. I mean, it's really important to to think that cap management and, and spare capacity is not one dimensional, right? You mentioned GPUs, you have the network side as well. Uh, you even have the control plane when, you, when you're starting to talk about, I mean, how many how many agents can we actually host in this region, depending on how you have actually set up the control plane, right? So, so it's, uh, yeah, like I said, it's multi-dimensional. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, we, we have similar measurements, like, like you mentioned, not just for the, the, the region, but also for individual resources of different kinds. And Chris, I'm curious to hear you. Yeah, so it's it's a little bit different. Um, we kind of depend on our, our private cloud customers to kind of make those determinations for us, but we we provide a few different like building blocks for them to choose to, to kind of scale their capacity accordingly. So it does kind of get pushed to them, but for our side, we do, we do struggle a little bit on on just figuring out like what mix to always have on stock just because it isn't logical just to have hardware like that just sitting. Um, a lot of our advantages does come from our, our full bare metal management system. So we're able to keep quote unquote like warm spares that are just powered off. So at least like we're, we're cutting some there, but it's, it's, it's still a challenge for us. And, and as we're kind of growing into it, it, it is a huge kind of learning experience for us to, to eventually kind of fully figure out. But right now, it's just mostly just looking at a rack, see, see what is what is used in, in what of one of our flex model pods um, to see and kind of determine when we order things. And, and yeah, with the, the hardware shortages as well, that that's also huge, because now we have to kind of forecast three, four months in advance of, of how our activity is going to look like. 
Yeah, that, that is interesting, this forecasting. We have a question from uh, from the audience. Um, it's from Yagia. Uh, I expect that I pronounced that correctly. So cloud capacity controlling uh, using machine learning. Um, any challenges? Uh, do we use machine learning to, to predict this? My understanding is not, right? We'd like to at some point. Yeah. Well, to use machine learning yeah, also, it requires a lot of data, right? Basically, yeah. I think regarding this machine learning, it's not just about uh, how much data you can have. So, for example, for us, yeah. we really have lots of data to be able to uh, put in machine learning. But uh, also, what from my point of view, machine learning is not able to predict. Uh, but your own business side, you are able to see, for example, this new upcoming, let's say, big projects. So these huge peaks. Uh, not sure for a normal growing, so for the normal trends, it's really good if you are able to uh, have uh, such kind of solution. But for these uh, exceptional peaks, uh, it will be really hard. Yeah. So, Brendan, now we are in the private cloud side. Do you relate yeah. to... Yeah, I really. What was raised here? <laughs> Definitely, <laughs> those. Yeah, it's from a capacity modeling point of view. I joined the team about two years ago and inherited really the operations of a very large uh, system. You know, it's like hundreds of thousands of bare metal nodes, tens of thousands of of VMs, uh, multiple clusters. We're just actually building out a whole new uh, cluster that we're trying to get. The company to move to all metal systems, move more into VM, you know, start using auto scaling, you know, software load balancing, all the new technologies. So we've got the the problem just now where we're trying to balance the old hardware and get people to move to the new. So we've got to scale the new as we reduce the old, but you have the overlap where nobody wants to move until they've tested and you know, everything's stable, so they want more capacity before they actually shut down any old capacity. So we're in a balancing act just now, and I think we're the you know we're the same. We collect basically as much data as we can down to the lowest level. You know, IP usage, you know, the volume size usage, NFS space, you know, vCPU memory, everything, and we we actually collect it all and send it to. Uh, our like grid system, so we we're very lucky in the uh, in the private cloud space and you know the Verizon Media. We have a, a team that runs Hadoop and and does a lot of uh, big data processing, so we can actually send all the data to them and and actually run some uh, data processing against it and try and generate some predictive modeling. Allows us to to manage the capacity better, but. You know, something that the guys touched on earlier was, you know, lead times as well. You know, the lead times are are changing quite a lot just now. You know, it's hard to get hardware when you want it. And I think that goes back to something else that was touched on is automation. You know, automating your processes. If you can automate ordering your systems and automate as soon as they come into the data center, getting them online in the correct place as quickly. You know, that's definitely, you know, somewhere where I think putting focus in, you can really make a difference because the actual hardware lead times are quite tricky just now. I think everyone's probably feeling. But, yeah, yeah I relate I to I, almost everything. And also I relate to, <laughs> with you, what you, what you said. Um, as being a private cloud, um, basically we control much more the workloads. Uh, we, know, we know how to predict the workloads that we're going to receive. Uh, so what I told you for this uh, less than 20% that we use it of the capacity for the services, for the users, um, we have that capacity available. And uh, it doesn't grow a lot because we know that the services will not increase a lot uh, in the IP departments. Um, so basically, when we replace the, the machines after five years on service, uh, when they are at the end of the life, Basically, we get new servers, and at that point, we get much more capacity because uh, the servers are are newer and they have much more processing power. So, in that case, we get more and more capacity, basically, with the same number uh, of resources um, at the end. 
and then we try to optimize use of that capacity that that is left until it's not used by by the, by the users. And I think that uh, it's a good um, topic now to touch next. Um, so as Victor said, having um, spare capacity, especially in public clouds, is inevitable. So how can we basically uh, mitigate this? How can we, or in case of public clouds, monetize that in a, in a better way, that li like that these resources are not lost? You want to start, Victor? Basically, I can, but uh, from my point of view, it would be even a high, uh, more harder to pick than the normal capacity management, because naturally, also, for example, what we can see in in not the OpenStack based uh, clouds, there are lots of different uh, techniques that is available. Uh, for example, the spot instances, but it was also a great thing what we just heard in the beginning in the introduction session, that uh, if you also optimize your internal processes regarding the test to use these uh, uh, spare capacity, Naturally, it's just work if you have different, for example, available zones and, and, and clusters, and then you are able to move your workload between the clusters. But uh, beside that, uh, the other thing uh, what you need to consider is uh, in OpenStack, naturally, currently, this post census is not, uh, not available. So currently, especially, for example, what I just mentioned, what we do, if uh, you just simply, let's say, stop your machines. In this way, it's not consume power and some other things. But naturally, then you are wasting your resources because it will be unused. It's not generate anything for you. But at least it's not generate also loss for you. If you would like to have some some better but, but things, are, you, are you saying uh, power off the the compute nodes? Yes, exactly. Okay. If you are able I, I to, saw, I saw that in in small clouds. I was no not no also in, in big some bigger ones. So if you would if you need to have lots of spare capacity, then it's much well, that's much more wise to stop some of your machines. Because instantly, you don't need all of the spare capacity. But uh, you know, if you just simply, it's, if it's installed and it's already included inside clusters, you just put it in maintenance and, and power of them, basically under some minutes, you will be able to power them on. So in this way, naturally, it's not generate money for you. Not, not gives more resources for you, but in this way, you can also avoid, still avoid the losses. So it's still better than, than nothing. On long term, what, uh, what I just mentioned, if you are able to figure out some uh, other use cases, like to use this spare capacity as a low, with a lower price and give it as a spot instance, or for example, to give it for some internal, uh, internal projects, trainings, or let's say whatever, then basically naturally it's more, uh, it's better because in this way you will not uh, uh, not waste the resources. But in this way, if it's not directly generate money, so if you're not talking about spot instances, just use for something else, then basically, yes, uh, from workload point of view, it will be better, but in this way also it's an investment from the company side to something else. Yeah. Uh, so I, is, I completely is, agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's 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 really hard. There there is something that you want to add, Chris? Um. No. I mean, I pretty much agree to that. Like that's why for for us, we we focus very heavily on how we just manage bare metal as a whole and and just maintain our our capacity and our inventory as as a whole, just as efficiently as possible. Eric. No, I, I, I mean, I agree. I, I mentioned a couple of use cases, so we try to solve it as well. Uh, yes, we do power off machines, but but we also have, we try to use it for, for pre-prod environments, staging environments in the same data center. So, so not necessarily powered off, but for, uh, I don't know, testing upgrades, lifecycle management, new projects uh, and so on, but also try to, to shift internal workloads to, to different regions based on, on on the current uh, metrics we're gathering from mm -hmm. from uh, for the spare capacity, uh, and about for example uh, price differentiation. Um, I, I know there is no spot instances in OpenStack, uh, but the price differentiation, for example, is still an option. Like uh, instances are cheaper 
in January, but uh, expensive, more expensive in December. Um, there is there is some these kind of techniques that uh, you guys use, or quotas, for example, or start over committing um, if you are lacking resources, for example. Basically, over commit uh, because you mentioned the lots of different from one of them. Uh, what I would like to react is uh, monthly based or time based uh, solution, and basically from our point of view, if you are able to define these uh, customer trends and if you are at a, an, uh, at a quite big scale, then for us this is not an issue. So if I check, for example, our workload, how it's in December, March, April, or basically any months, there will be no significant peak. So in this way, this time-based ones, basically for us, is not uh, uh, not helpful. Uh, but the other ones, what you mentioned, this, this overcommitment, I think it's a different topic. But regarding spare capacity, from my point of view, it will not help at all, because if you are a uh, cloud provider, then at the same price, you need to sell the same thing. So in this way, if I create a flavor, naturally, every time uh, the performance must be the same. So in this way, if I set up over commitment for the same flavor, then the customers will st instantly start to complain. They will be mm -hmm. not happy. But naturally, if at the beginning also you create such kind of flavor that you use over commitment, this is what we also do. So we have some machines what is dedicated for a flavor with over commitment ratio two or three. Not sure it's well known by the customers and it's cheaper, but they can also choose uh, what we called, for example, uh, dedicated general purpose, but is also almost like the same without over commitment. But from capacity point of view, at least for us, basically it's, it's, uh, it's not helpful. It's something like just a different flavor. Right, I, I understand. Brandon. Yeah, something that you want to we add? Have, yeah, I think one of the other things that I'm beginning to see more now as well, and it all depends really on what tooling and systems people use for deployments. But for example, we have we have some teams that want to use blue green deployments uh, on Terraform, for example. I think we are. So, Losing Brandon. Oh, no, we, you're back. Am I back again? Yeah, yeah, you're ah, back. Okay. Yeah, I don't know where I'm to there, but I was talking about uh, you know Terraform and, and doing automated deployments with blue green uh, mechanisms. So you know, basically, some teams need double capacity, and it, it starts to get tricky to manage. We try and use quota, you know, allocations to manage, but then. You have to manage the unbooted quota versus booted quota, and I think it'll, you know, if you're doing a chargeback model, obviously, you know, you're going to charge more for people that are actually using instances. But you really want to keep that other capacity available. But if it gets to the point where everyone is doing that, you really don't want to keep double capacity. You know, it doesn't make sense at that point. So I think it's definitely a balancing act on how and how you can manage that, and it's something that. You know, we're definitely looking at going forward uh, to see what we can do there and how mm -hmm. how the best way to manage that is. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of interesting uh, issues to deal with in managing spare capacity. Thank you. I also would like to to tell you what we uh, do at CERN. Um, and our, our use case is completely different from uh, yours use case. Um, as a scientific organization, we try to squeeze all the capacity that we have available in the data center. And uh, for example, um, imagine when we are decommissioning, decommissioning compute nodes because they are at the end of the life. Uh, there is this period that we remove the work production workloads from them. We like migrate instances or we remove all the instances if they are for batch processing. And there is this period that the compute nodes are still up um, because the operations team didn't touch them to start removing them in bulk. So they are still on. So what we usually do to try to squeeze the, everything from the resources is to use volunteer computing like Boink, um, to basically to process um, data for, for, for the scientific community. 
So two projects that we use is the LHC at home. So that is basically uh, different simulations that help then the researchers at CERN to improve the LHC. Uh, something that we also run a lot last year was the Rosetta at home. So that is a, a, as well a Boeing volunteer computing project um, that tries to help the design of the new molecules uh, for proteins that um, and at the COVID times, we thought that will be very useful to, to help. So when we have this kind of spare capacity, we'll try to use, use it with these uh, scientific projects as well. Um, however, something that I feel that uh, it will be great that OpenStack Cloud's uh, support um, will be spot instances or printable instances, as you want to call it. Do you feel the, the same need of the project that, that needs to support this? That will be a, a good addition to the OpenStack um, cloud. What do you think about it? I would say definitely yes, at least from our side. So basically, we would uh, happy to see this in, in, in OpenStack. And we are already uh, started to think about, for example, how we can do it on OpenStack basically by our own because as you just mentioned it's not yet uh, not yet in the open stack base so i think for for cloud providers it can really help a lot also regarding this efficiency point of view and capacity management point of view do others share this uh, the same opinion yeah uh, i mean it would be very beneficial for us as well definitely especially in the public domain because price tends to be uh, bigger thing there uh, we have more smaller companies and in, in and actually individuals running in the public uh, arena and, and uh, i think the price point alone uh, for such a thing would uh, greatly benefit us as well and for for i mean spare capacity like you mentioned chris brendan um, yeah, I mean, yeah, more so for, for like our internal clusters and everything like that. And, and some of our public, I, we would definitely see a great use of it, but, um, for public or for a private cloud offering, it just, yeah, maybe to, to pass down to, to the customer of it, it'd probably be good, but for the way we look at it, it, it really doesn't apply to us as, as heavily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think after this. Um, you know, for that perspective, it's probably not quite as relevant as uh, the public cloud. Uh, yeah. Okay. In, a, in our use case um, in the CERN cloud, we are not a public provider, but as a private cloud, actually, we feel a lot the, a lot the need for a feature like this. Um, I can give you an example. For example, if uh, hardware is purchased for a specific project and that project doesn't need uh, from the day one all the capacity that was purchased because they will expand over time. Um, so we fill this gap. So how are we going to fill up those available resources? Of course, what we do is manually, we provision uh, batch nodes, batch virtual machines in those resources to, to use capacity. The problem is that when then the original user um, for where the resources were purchased for uh, starts to create instances, the, their instances will fail because the resources are being used for other use cases for batch. So then there is this manual process to remove batch instances for the original user to create their instances. So we see that this is the typical um, preemptible instance use case. Um, and actually, we did some work on this. So around three, four years ago. Um, and this was initially an open lab project with uh, Huawei. So we started to design a solution to bring printable instances into OpenStack. Um, later, we also work uh, in collaboration with uh, SKA. SKA is the square kilometer array observatory. And this was initially thinking um, uh, of the scientific uses cases for the scientific community inside OpenStack. Um, we gave several presentations 
uh, around this topic, around the printable instances in OpenStack. We developed uh, a prototype um, that we believe it's quite good. Actually, we are running it in our production cloud, which allow us to have uh, printable instances um, in our clouds. However, this ties completely with Nova and placements, and it will be it will be great if the community picks this up and uh, integrates this with the uh, OpenStack Nova and placement. Um, and I think this is one of the things that uh, the operators uh, community could uh, could raise this concern and this need for this kind of feature. Um, if you are interested on this. Um, we wrote a blog post basically where we expose our last experience. Uh, the code is available. You guys can have a look. Um, and let us know if you if you have any comments. All right, so we are approaching the end. Um, there are several questions uh, from the audience. Um, hi, Thierry. Yes, uh, I think you thanks. want to go through them. Thanks, Belmiro. Yeah, we have lots of questions. We probably won't have enough time to answer them all, but uh, there are a few that uh, we wanted to to plug to this discussion. Uh, the first one is from Niels Magnus, uh, and it it's around automation and because we touched on on like machine learning in various ways. Um, so his question is: How can automation leverage capacity management? Is it uh, is an investment in these activities well spent? Or are workloads always so different individual anyway that you can't really plan them? Yep. I think, uh, yeah, first of all, but I would like to say that from my point of view, basically any spent on automation, not just in capacity part, is really worth. So I think really uh, this is the future because, uh, yeah, it will be much more faster, much more accurate and, and much easier for any other companies. And basically also from capacity management point of view, it can help a lot. This is what we also uh, touched in the room in the discussion in this session because with automation you will be also able to reduce the time what will what is your lead time to be able to provide more capacity so in this way uh, you don't need to let's say think forward for for example for months or or years or weeks you just need to think forward for the following some days if you are able to uh, fully automate your solution and also there is one other part regarding this the real capacity management automation where we not just consider how we can let's say provide more resources but also what can predict uh, based on the trends and what is able to let's say uh, even on themselves decide what we will need and what we need to install so from my point of view in the short answer is yes every any every cent what is spent on automation is really worth yeah i also very much agree with that i mean for for our case and especially with with being able to scale the way you need to you know the, the faster you can scale with automation just increases those you know yes like there's there's always going to be scenarios where you're going to get hit and you just don't have the capacity there but if you have the automation also in place to to add capacity you know that's that's just as important anyone else yeah i agree the automation i think is key because it gives you productive lead times you know you know you have a you know deeper understand timelines that things are going to take which allows you to then plan correctly and you know possibly reduce your overhead and your additional capacity because you know exactly how long it's going to take you know for that automation to go through and for new capacity to land in your in your cluster so you know from that point alone i think it's it's definitely worth the the time putting into automation if you leave it down to individuals that you know everyone's busy everyone gets pulled into different things it's not predictable and it's definitely definitely makes a, a big difference, I think, having spending the time in the automation side of things. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree as well. And, and for sure, there are different aspects of, of the whole process that are harder to 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 automate in the sense of lead times. Uh, I mean, you have the whole ordering of the hardware, which is, I mean, it is what it is. Uh, but but I mean, uh, I completely agree with everyone else that, uh, I mean. 
everything that is manual labor should be automated. Uh, both, both from a, I mean, both from a, a lead time perspective, but also, I mean, from from quality assurance perspective and so on as well. When it comes to to, uh, I mean, using the the, the modern uh, GitOps approach, for example, and then declaratively move move new hardware between stages between your CMDB, for example, to to automatically take it from newly racked to be in fully production. I, com I completely agree as well with the automation. Um, and actually what we are trying to do now uh, with automation is to leverage um, Ironic to, to provision our bare metal resources um, in the CERN cloud in an automated and integrated way. OK, thanks. Um, so the next question is from Saleh Ushangi, and it's actually around storage because we've We've talked a lot about computing and uh, compute resources, and but obviously elasticity also also strikes in storage or networking. Uh, so he's taking the example of a Ceph RBD cluster, who could, which could have a capacity of ten thousand IOPs and and uh, thousand gigabyte storage. However, as the RBD cluster scales to uh, two thousand gigabytes, the IOP scale to 20,000 IOPs, basic quality of service allows you to define hard limits for volumes. So the question is, which one of those strategies is being used uh, in your in your case and, and why? And But but it it's also the broader question around, is basically storage triggering uh, challenges that are different from, from compute? Basically, from my point of view, yes, it's a, it's a little bit different because, uh, you know, for example, for this, uh, uh, for, for storage, what we discussed this uh, fragmentation and lots of other things because th there you don't have so much flavors you don't need to, you don't need to consider. So I would say from storage point of view, it's easier, but most of the cloud provider also, for example, regarding the storage use much higher and almost everywhere over commitment. So in this way, the only difference that uh, you need to differentiate between uh, two different parts, one of them is the allocation, one of them is the physical, uh, uh, the real physical usage of your uh, of your storage devices, and basically regarding this one, regarding this uh, uh, IOP question, yes, it's really, from my point of view, it's it's uh, really important to set up some uh, hard limits because then in this way you are able to avoid that uh, uh, some customers can affect other ones, and I think it's it's really important to uh, to make that happen. And if you would like to have different kind of, because I think it's also really important in the, in the public, but I guess also on the uh, private and, and the hybrid ones, uh, to provide different uh, uh, IOP numbers. So for example, then you can build a storage solution based on SATA-disk, then on SAS-disk, and then on SSDs. And then you, uh, for the different cluster, you will be able to set up different height limits for the, uh, for the IOPs. So in this way, you will be able to serve out uh, everything. And based on these height limits, you are able to avoid that uh, any of the customers affect the other one. Yeah, I think, I mean, for storage, which, which is for sure a little bit different. I mean, you have two. You have two primary uh, scaling mechanisms. One is for, for pure storage demands. The other one is for, for keeping up with the performance uh, overall uh, based on all the resources that are running there. And I mean, you also have the, the IOPS per gigabyte uh, functionality in Nova and KVM you can utilize where you actually get more, where you get paid more. Uh, uh, I mean, to, so, so the customer will actually pay for both the, the performance and, and uh, I mean the amount of storage that are that they are using, and of course, I mean uh, different storage backends or or uh, different kind of hard drives, and you you you're building based on if you're buying a, a high performant SSD storage or if you're buying more. I mean you can go even down to like archiving uh, archiving storage, which is really slow, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So so yeah. Yeah, I mean, similar. Um, with our internal workloads, yeah, we we do tend to, to set hard limits just to make sure that we don't we don't destroy each other in there. But for some of our private offerings, we we offer storage planes, and 
that have multiple different storage types. So we have a mix between SATA, SSD, and, and NVMEs for, for whatever options that they, they need to kind of scale in or whatever their storage needs happen to be. So we don't we don't actually make that decision for them, but we give them the proper like platform and we do mostly set up some best practices for them as well. Okay. Uh, Brandon, did you have a, some comment on yeah. this? I think we're similar as well. Uh, you know, we offer the different different solutions, SSDs, SATA drives, uh, even NFS via Manila. Uh, and we try and implement hard limits, but we try and leave them quite high level. And then we have monitoring on the system to make sure we don't have different teams stomping on each other because we want to offer the, you know, that the, the fastest service and best service we can uh, up to a certain level you know as long as there's no issues within the system then then it's okay so it's a bit of a, a balancing act between limits that aren't too tight and the monitoring solution to make sure we don't have any issues across the cluster so we try and balance it that way Okay, we're reaching the end one last question um, so from uh, from Prakash uh, do you see the role of collaboration amongst OpenStack cloud service providers in different location to enable utility computing like power grids for load sharing? Should Open, Open Infra work with UN or other countries to raise the ability to help contain costs? And I guess it, it's a different take at, at spare capacity and, and, and handling elasticity. Basically, can we just reuse uh, the interoperability between OpenStack clouds to solve part of the problem. I guess it's more a question for public clouds, but uh, do you see that as one of the dimensions that you can you can use, or uh, is it is it more complicated than that? Maybe Victor or Johan. I mean, I, it's a tricky question to answer, but uh, I think we're. See, I mean, we're seeing something at least in, in with the whole Gaia X, uh, Gaia X projects and so on are, are that are ongoing, uh, where where interoperability and and um, sharing identity as as a consumer of of uh, different European cloud providers is is coming in as well. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Yep, uh, basically, I would say the same thing that was just mentioned. That it, it's really not it's really not uh, an easy to, topic to answer, and not just to answer, also to create such kind of a solution or something like that. So, every different uh, provider working in a different way. So, if you would like to do something, what can be used, let's say, uh, all over them, then there should be a really huge collaboration. And I think it's uh, it's really not so easy uh, to achieve that. And even if you consider, uh, for example, what was mentioned here, uh, this uh, power grid, then uh, yeah, it will be even more complicated. Okay. So I would I would not expect that in the near future it will come. Yeah, it will be no, interesting. And... Go ahead. I go. No, it will be interesting to see if if Gaia X uh, takes on and and allows really those providers to interoperate and if that shifts the landscape of this like infinite capacity to uh, a network of smaller actors rather than uh, a, few, a few big actors. Um, so I think it's time for us to wrap this up. Um, thanks uh, to all of our awesome guests today and this was really a great discussion and we've learned a lot from the diverse viewpoints and, uh, and experiences. Next week, uh, we'll have another uh, great episode lined up. We'll be discussing Kata Containers, which is uh, an open source project supported by the Open Infrastructure Foundation, allowing infrastructure users to benefit from the security of VMs while keeping the agility and speed of containers. So uh, it will be a very interesting one. I recommend it. Uh, also remember that if you have an idea for a future episode, we want to hear from you. Uh, submit your ideas to ideas.openinfra.live. 
and um, mark your calendars. I hope you'll all be able to join us next Thursday at 14 UTC. Thanks again to all of our speakers who joined us today and see you all on the next Open Infra Live.